two doors and one window. One door is red and the other is gray. I cannot open the red door. The gray door does not interest me. Having no choice, I shall lock them both and look out of the window. She came to the door because you had to be there on time. She made a beautiful meal and it was all prepared, everything ready, and it was... Souffle, oh, you and usually her, would her, drop uh, if you come late. Exactly. Wasn't that the drink? Yes, yes. Well, the, drinking, the drinking had to start at a certain hour because Eve was not allowed to take a drink until I think it was 6.30. Then he could have his first drink. Uh, but it was also rude to have a drink before your company came. So you had to be there by 6.30. <laughs> and he was just ready to... <laughs> get his first doctor. <laughs> Wham! Bang into the shaker. <laughs> she was an ironic woman. She had a wonderful sense of humor and a biting uh, sense of sarcasm. And I think it was that cold sarcasm that struck you first, both in her paintings and in her, in her personality. She very often named paintings and then changed them afterwards when she felt that they were too, gave too easy a clue to what her meaning was. Because uh, she wanted people to know intuitively what her pictures were about. Mm -hmm. And if they couldn't uh, tell, she didn't consider them a worthy audience. So she just made it as hard as possible for them. I think I was 10 when I went to Egypt, and I think I was 10 when I took the bullets out of my mother's revolver, which she had put loaded on her dressing table. I think I was 10 the first time she made me give her a hypodermic of morphine. The only times I remember being really happy were on the boat that was taking me to Europe. In the cabin, there were two wash basins that pulled down from the wall. We could never use more than one of them, and the other I kept permanently down. I made the water blue with watercolors, painted a shore around the edge, and made all sorts of little boats that sailed about. When it was rough, the shore would be washed away, and I would each time repaint it with a new landscape. As a child, Kay Sage traveled to Europe with her mother every year. Born on January 25th, 1898, in Albany, New York, Catherine Lynn Sage was the second daughter of Henry Manning Sage. Kay's conservative father and her unconventional mother were separated in 1900. On living in San Francisco just two years after the earthquake and fire, Kay wrote, We were in a hotel room when my mother told me about the divorce. I cried because I thought it meant that my mother would be a widow dressed in black with a long black veil. Everything was always better in Italy. We had servants, and as we had the same villa every year, it seemed to me like going home. I learned a lot of things from the cook. Never to pick up a peacock's feather. Never to start anything. Kay determined to study art seriously and moved to Rome in 1920. I started working in earnest at my painting. I drew from life at the various academias, always staying away on the days the professor came to criticize. And I met an artist called Onorato Calandi, who was to be my inspiration. His creed was liberty. He did not teach me to paint. He didn't even try to. But he taught me to think as I hadn't thought to think before. Kay avoided society life and saw only the people she worked with. Through an accidental encounter, she fell in love with the handsome but aimless Prince Ranieri de San Faustino. After a long engagement, they were married in 1925 and lived in his palazzo. During her 10 years as a princess, Kay produced few paintings. She became bored with her husband and with Italian high society. She wrote and illustrated a children's book of poetry in Italian, It's Raining in the Garden, published in 1937. Caterina, Caterina, enough of your airs. A good young lady doesn't do so many things. Be an actress if you like, or study drawing, but don't do a hundred things all very well. Go ahead and write your book, play your piano, one thing at a time and you'll go very far. Katerina, Katerina, think about it and be careful. A good young lady chooses one path only. With her divorce from the prince in 1935, 
Kay drew and painted with renewed interest and exhibited her work for the first time in Milan the next year. She painted her first abstractions in 1937 when she moved to Paris. She was 39 years old. Her ideas for painting were soon influenced by the Surrealists. Entering the circle of artists and writers that included André Breton, Max Ernst, and Yves Tanguy, whom she was to marry, she found an intellectual milieu that suited her. A brief period of non-objective paintings was followed by new work, informed and supported by a range of Surrealist notions. The expression of imagery from the unconscious, the surprising non-rational juxtaposition of objects, the shock of paradox. Most directly, like Tanguy, Magritte, she was impressed by the spirit of the paintings of Giorgio de Chirico's metaphysical period. Who can deny the disturbing relationship between perspective and metaphysics? With clairvoyance, we are constructing and painting a new metaphysical psychology of objects, the absolute awareness of the space that an object must occupy in a painting, and of the space that divides each object from the others, establishes a new astronomy of things, connected to our planet by the fatal law of gravity. Kay's work began by reflecting de Chirico's enigmatic approach to objects within architectural settings. But she evolved a personal iconography, a vision of suspended time and space, uniquely nostalgic and ironic, like her poetry. The color of white. White is not always white. That I found out a long time ago. But let's not confuse flexibility with lack of integrity. Kay moved to New York in 1939 with the onset of the Second World War. There she helped to arrange a series of one-man shows for several of the artists still in Paris. The first was for Tanguy. They lived in New York and married in 1940. In 41, they settled in Connecticut for the rest of their lives. In that year, Kay held her first American exhibition at the Pierre Matisse Gallery. Afterwards, she showed regularly at the Julian Levy Gallery and later at the Catherine Viviano Gallery. Well, I thought primarily they were very legitimately surrealist. And that was one of my specialties. And that was why I was interested in Tangi's work. Mm -hmm. I've always thought of her work as being a little bit cold. It surprised me, in a, in a way, in a woman, that it should be so um, brainy, intellectual, and, and really cool. It was very hard to get to the warmth in K. It was there. It took me several years to find it. If overshadowed by Tangi's greater reputation, K nevertheless worked with conviction and received positive reviews throughout the 40s and 50s. Kay and Eve painted separately and methodically, playing as their friend James Thrall Sobey described it, a kind of double solitaire. Mutation. Do not count on me. I change much as the moving mountain range. My premises slide a bit every season. Never for any good reason. If a hole were just a hole without a thing around it, who would know it was a hole? And how would they have found it? Maybe you think you know me better than I do. No, I never pretended to know you. I can't reconcile the contradictions in your character. Oh, those? They're not contradictions. They're just the two sides of the question. Sometimes they amalgamate and sometimes they don't. When they do, they become a combination rather than a contradiction. That's what I am. I'm a combination. The clock. Have you ever seen at the precise moment you were looking at it, a clock stop? I have, it makes you feel funny. Nothing moves anymore. Time is suspended forever. 
As an idea, I rather like that. In my opinion, it should not be pushed around. But never mind, let's drop our prejudices. What difference does it make what time it is? My house has no foundations. It is built on rock and rubble. It stands there by the grace of God with very little trouble. It's just as good as any house, although it's not so steady. But for the day it tumbles down, my plans are made already. I have built a tower on despair. You hear nothing in it, there's nothing to see. There's no response when black on black I scream, I scream in my ivory tower. Everyone is incomplete, like a glass with a big piece broken out of it. Whether we are aware of it or not, we are always looking for the piece that will make us whole. We find one piece, think it is going to fit. It does, in part. We had not realized that the missing piece was in several pieces. The first piece of glass we find is the first great love. Each successive piece, like the first, is only a part of the whole piece which is missing. Much later, I found all the pieces and put them in place so the glass is now perfect. Then I can drink out of it? No. Why not? Because it is empty. Can't you fill it? No. Why not? Because there's nothing to fill it with. I drank all there was. Don't you think she was lonely with Eve? He was a great big naughty boy, and she tried to uh, mother him and discipline him, and that's not a very companionable way to live. <laughs> the thing that I remember most clearly uh, is that he refused to help her in any way with her own painting. It was an almost um, hostile uh, reaction. She would have to find her own ways, he had. But he was not going to interfere either, was he? No. No. It never saw occurred to me Maybe to compare either. their work. Kay's fundamental uh, material seemed to me like that game called Jack Straws. Mm -hmm. You know, those little shape mm -hmm. the objects that you build up in a pile and then very, you try to pull, pull one out, out without just, uh, uh, destroying the whole structure. How we sort of uh, Eve as being submarine, some pebble, mm -hmm. um, fathoms of water, and strange life for her and through it. And they worked in very separate studios. One thing they had in common was that they were extremely neat and meticulous. In 1947, they both participated in the international exhibition of surrealism, which marked the last major group show of the formal movement. In January 1955, Kay was troubled one day when a wild bird flew into the house. To her, it was a sign of a death in the family. Just a few days later, Yves Tanguy was suddenly taken ill. He died at a nearby hospital. A Bird in the Room was the first painting Kay completed after Tanguy's death. She was 57 years old and alone. She began writing her memoirs, which she called China Eggs, and kept a notebook. The first entry reads, The 8th, 1955. I'm walking very fast on a thin sheet of ice. Underneath, the lake is deep. I'm alone. There's nothing, even at the horizon. If I stop even for a second, the ice breaks and I drown. I catch myself up and continue. Why? I could so easily stop walking. May 1st, 1955. The only person I know who had the courage to sit quietly and look at life was Eve. He looked at it with humor, with anguish, with joy, and sometimes with indulgence, but he always looked it straight in the eye. May 1955. Hide the things you know are true. Never try to explain them. 
same year, Kay was describing her childhood memories in China Eggs and painting her large canvas, Tomorrow is Never. She was recalling her mother's dependence on morphine when she wrote, There is no such thing as no pain. At best, you can detach yourself from it. You can do this by taking the pain out of yourself, setting it up as a monument, and walking around it. I can talk about it because I have done it. I have walked through entire parks of pain, observing each monument as one would observe a piece of sculpture, seeing the form with its sharp or rounded edges, the planes and the terrible points, but being quite apart from it. If you learn to do this, you can stand physical pain. You can use the same system for mental pain, but you go crazy. In her increasing loneliness and depression, she painted some of her strongest works. After years of her private vocabulary of veiled and objectified figures, the passage appears with the shock of direct personal exposure. Destiny. If I turn back, at least I shall not have the sun in my face. But then there will always be the long shadow of myself before me. July 1956. There are many ways to kill yourself. One is to die very quietly, not doing anything at all. That is the way I have chosen. It is disorder which keeps us here. Nothing is ever finished. Kay called watching the clock a painting object. She asked Judson Darrow, a gunsmith, to shoot two bullets through the work at precise points. He did this with her own gun that she kept in the house for protection. She meant to indicate that even mechanical things can be hurt. April 17th, 1959. The heart isn't going anymore. If it doesn't end soon, I'll go completely mad. When a watch is wound too tight, the mainspring breaks. I have reached that point. April 27, 1959. The first painting of Eve's that I saw, before knowing him, had for its title, I'm waiting for you. I came, now he's waiting for me again. I'm going. On April 29, 1959, I killed myself. I do not like the person who has replaced me. She has no spirit. She's lonely and afraid. Someday, very soon, I will have to shoot her. Kay had taken an overdose of sleeping pills, but had recovered. Despite a double cataract operation, Kay's eyesight became worse. She gave up painting and instead made reliefs and small objects. She produced watercolor collages by cutting rock forms out of the painted paper, pasting them and then painting in their shadows. In 1961, Catherine Viviano exhibited the carefully composed objects and collages with her ironic poem, Your Move. These are games without issue. Some have been played and are therefore static. Others will be and can still be played. There are no rules. No one can win or lose. They are arbitrary and irrelevant. But there is no reason why anything should mean more than its own statement. Two and two do not necessarily make four. If that is a scientist at my door, please tell him to go away. She said, I have to make these because I can't see well enough to paint, and I can feel these. And I said, to my taste, these are actually marvelous. Mm -hmm. I like, I'm more enthusiastic about them than I ever would have after. What did she think about that? I mean, she said, no, it isn't. It's not going to do me. She didn't see old age as a growing uh, wisdom. It would be just a uh, handicap for her. August 1961. I have said all I have to say. There's nothing left to do but scream. 
she was reaching the passage. And some do it, we all have to do it different manner. She was ready for, she was ready for the next move. On January 8th, 1963, Kay Sage shot herself in the heart and died. It is not difficult to know what you want and to get it. The difficulty lies in remembering, once you have it, that it was this that you wanted. What you have had and have discarded should never again be desirable. Life would be all right if we could just keep on wanting.